Hello, or as we say here in College Station, Texas, howdy, I'm Santiago. Welcome to the fourth program of our environmental awareness video series. This video is brought to you by the Bush Education Department at the George H. W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum here in College Station, Texas. Visuals used in this program will come with audio descriptions. This picture is of George H. W. Bush. As we discussed in the three previous programs, President George H. W. Bush was a huge supporter of protecting the environment. We first discussed the Clean Air Act of 1990, as well as the impact it had on protecting the air we breathe, the ozone layer, and the various bird species it saved. Next, we discussed the North American Wetlands Conservation Act that President George H. W. Bush signed into law, which made it a goal to protect the wetlands that currently exist, as well as restore those that had been destroyed. In the third video program, we talked about the wildlife refuge system, how various presidents have contributed to protecting at-risk wildlife, including President Bush. He has the distinction of creating the most national marine sanctuaries during any presidential term. He created six of them. Now we will discuss the Antarctic Protection Act of 1990, also signed by President Bush. But before we do, let's briefly discuss a little bit about world geography. In this picture, you see Antarctic Expedition. It's just a picture of an explorer. Antarctica is the southernmost continent in the world and is 5.483 million square miles. It is the fifth largest of our seven continents and is home to the South Pole. It is pretty much just a nice filled land and its name, which literally derives from the Greek meaning of the opposite of the Arctic. It is, in essence, just land filled with ice and snow. So the Northern Hemisphere has the Arctic, whereas the Southern Hemisphere has Antarctica. In this picture, you see a trans-Antarctic expedition vehicle. Antarctica is essentially uninhabitable for humans, meaning that it is impossible to live on. Only about 1,000 to 5,000 people will live in Antarctica in a year. This also depends on the season. Most people that live on Antarctica are researchers that primarily live on outposts across the coastline of this continent. This image displays Antarctic researchers, as well as their outpost in the Antarctic. And again, it's uninhabitable for its extremely cold temperatures and lack of resources. This picture is just meant to give you a sense of scale of the Antarctic and what an expedition hunt might look like. In Antarctica, the continent only really has two seasons, summer and winter. Summer lasts six months, where you have constant daylight during those six months, and for the other six months, you have winter, which is just constant darkness. This happens because of the tilt on the Earth's axis. The Earth orbits the Sun in different paths. As the tilt shifts through its orbit, different parts of the world are exposed to different amounts of direct sunlight. For example, when it is winter in the Northern Hemisphere, it is summer in the Southern Hemisphere and vice versa. During summer, Antarctica is on the side facing the sun and is in constant sunlight due to the, again, Earth's tilt. In the winter, Antarctica is faced away from the sun and thus the reason for the darkness. Did you know Antarctica is the highest continent on Earth? It is an ice sheet that goes a mile and a half above sea level. This is what makes it cooler than the North Pole its elevation. The North Pole is like a handful of ice cubes, whereas the Southern Pole is the cooler full of ice. Both the North and South Pole see equals amount of solar radiation, which is just fancy science words for saying they get the same amount of sunlight through the year. But now let's talk about the Antarctic Protection Act. The Antarctic Conservation Act, or the ACA, protects native animals, birds, mammals, and plants and their ecosystems. The law applies to all U.S. citizens going to Antarctica, whether or not they go to Antarctica with the U.S. Antarctic program, as well as any Antarctic expeditions that originate from the United States. Without a permit, it is illegal to take native animals such as mammals or birds, endanger them in a harmful way, interfere through pollution or ice destruction, enter Antarctic specialty protected areas, introduce species into Antarctica, introduce substances that are designated as waste, discharge designated waste, 
import certain Antarctic items into the U.S. or export them to another country. The Antarctic Conservation Act incorporates into the U.S. Regulation of the Environment Standard set forth by the Protocol on Environmental Protection, which was developed by a consensus by representatives of the U.S. and other Antarctic Treaty nations. The Protocol designates Antarctica as a natural reserve devoted to peace, science, and exploration. The Antarctic Treaty and Environmental Protocol Protection form the basic guidelines for all human activity on the Antarctic continent. For more information, see the website, the Secretariat of the Antarctic Treaty. Now let's start talking about food webs and food chains and grill. This picture depicts a simple food web. Food webs and food chains are man-made models which explain the way in which animals and plants live in an ecosystem. As we say, it's all part of the circle of life, just like in the movie The Lion King. We know that animals use other plants and animals to survive by eating them to gain energy. For example, in the Antarctic, you would likely see some type of seals eating penguins for food. This not only feeds them, but also makes sure that penguins don't overpopulate and eventually die due to starvation as they ate all the fishes and krill. So even if it may seem sad, it is all part of a natural cycle that keeps the ecosystem in balance of resources and population which allows life to exist. Let's take a look at the food chain in the animal kingdom, but more specifically a food chain in Antarctica. As we mentioned, seals eat penguins. However, what do penguins eat, you might be wondering? Well, most of the time they eat fish or krill that comes and migrates into the Antarctic waters. The main reason they swim is to eat. These fish also need to eat. So when there's not much to eat, you might be wondering, well, what do they eat? Well, larger fish, often eat smaller fish and again krill. This is an image of a krill. And likewise, these small fish and krill will eat plankton to survive, and it keeps looping. But this is where the loop starts to go back around. Now, I talked about seals, but you might not know this. Seals are often eaten by killer whales, and killer whales are considered the apex predator because nothing really eats them. Nothing is, is above them in terms of something that might eat them. However, what happens when a killer whale dies, right? A killer whale needs a lot of seals, needs a lot of food to survive. So there's not a lot of them. They don't really have an overpopulation problem. But what happens when animals just suddenly die? They're not necessarily killed by other animals for food. Well, that's where decomposers come into play. Decomposers are a type of animal or a type of microbe or bacteria that latches onto dead animals and starts consuming them. And that bacteria quickly grows and grows and grows. And then that bacteria is eaten by the plankton and small fish. And so you finally get that loop. And that's essentially what a food web is. The picture shown depicts geese migrating from colder temperatures to warmer temperatures. Now that you sort of have a grasp on food webs and a food web that you might find in Antarctica, let's start talking about the seasonal migrations of birds. Now you might be thinking, well, there probably isn't too many birds in the Antarctic. It's very cold, so I doubt any type of bird would try to migrate down here because it's warmer. And you're right, but there's one bird species that you might not be thinking of, and that is the penguin. The penguin actually does migrate, unlike most people think that because they cannot fly, they do not migrate. This is wrong, and we'll talk about it, but first let me introduce you to the concept of bird migration, just in case you're not familiar. Bird migration might be a topic by which you know something about, as we've covered it in the past, but I will talk a little bit more about how bird migration affects Antarctica, again, penguins. But if you want some more in-depth looks at general bird migration, I suggest you look back at our first video's program. Bird migration is the process by which birds in a flock migrate to warmer climates to escape the cold. For example, a bird that lives in Canada might want to move down to Central America because during the winter, it will get very, very cold in Canada, and in Central America, it stays relatively warm during the year. This image shows the emperor penguin. In the case of the emperor penguin, it is a life or death struggle to migrate. You see, in the Antarctic, the temperatures are often far below freezing. But even here, the temperatures can get so cold that penguins must migrate as their food source runs away from them. Think of fish and krill. This, as well as the need to go somewhere warmer, to hatch their babies often leads them to have a strong desire to migrate further south into the Antarctic Peninsula. This allows them to live in a warmer climate with more food 
while they raise their young. If you don't know too much about the Antarctic Peninsula, it's just a peninsula connected to the Antarctic. And as you go further down the peninsula, you start to get warmer and warmer climates. Because again, you're starting to avoid the south and go towards the central, where it is a little bit warmer at least. I hope I was able to teach you a thing or two about the Antarctic, including uh, penguins, their food chains, food source, and how they migrate. We also covered the Antarctic Protection Act and how President Bush's involvement has led to essential support of the Antarctic environment. Also, that this environment should be supported for its complex and majestic beauty. Thank you, Santiago. That was a great lesson. It was cool to think about how, though penguins cannot fly, they still have the same instinct as many other birds to migrate. It was also cool to think about how all animals are part of a larger food web that connects them all together. Next, Santiago is going to tell us a bit more about how animals stay warm in the Antarctic. This is especially important because the South Pole is colder than the North Pole. On top of being the coldest continent, it is also the windiest. And on top of that, much of it is a polar desert, meaning it sees little to no rain and is covered in permanent layers of ice. Now, I don't know about you, but I think ice all day, every day, is an excellent reason to figure out how to stay warm. So let's hear from Santiago how the animals stay insulated and warm. I'm here to teach you a little bit about insulation. So let's get started. Now, previously you've talked about the Antarctic, the animals that you might encounter, uh, general facts, uh, logistics of the Antarctic, but here we're going to narrow it down a little bit more to insulation. But before we do that, I have to explain what insulation is, right? Uh, so insulation, in the most very basic terms, is keeping heat trapped inside. So for example, let's say I have, pretend for a second, this isn't a uh, water bottle, this is a hot cup of coffee, right? So if this is a hot cup of coffee, I want to keep my coffee hot. So how do I do that? Well, there's a couple ways that you could do it. One of them is, uh, let's say you have a piece of paper or a rag. So you wrap your coffee in said piece of paper and rag. And that layer will prevent heat from going outwards because the way heat likes to move is to go from hot place to a cold place. The cup of coffee is very hot. My hand is relatively cold. Outside it's air conditioned, so it's very cold. So the heat in the cup wants to go outside. I'm using this piece of paper to trap the heat in further so the coffee remains hot. And that's essentially insulation. It's just wrapping something and preventing heat from escaping. Heat normally also rises. That's why you see uh, balloons uh, every day. Uh, they, they use hot air and flames, and that hot air rises to the top of the air balloon, and that causes the air balloon to rise. And so when you see this phenomenon and understand it, insulation and heat transfer, you can sort of see why in the Antarctic, where it's very, very cold, they very desperately depend on insulation, right? There's not a lot of heat, it's very, very cold, and so if they let any of the heat escape, it's gonna instantly go outside where it's much, much colder. And so whether you be an animal or whether you be a human, you need to figure out how to insulate yourself. Now, animals have a leg up on us because they've evolved to figure out ways to stay uh, warm and stay insulated, right? Uh, a fur seal, for example, has blubber, and fur, whereas a penguin has feathers which are waterproof, which allow it to swim, not fly, um, but also keep it very warm. And so these three things, blubber, fur, and feathers, allow animals to stay hot. They, they allow them to insulate themselves and regulate their temperature, right? Because again, the Antarctic is very, very cold. And so, for example, uh, when we talk about blubber, you can imagine sort of fat. It's, it's sort of a fat that the body needs to survive in order to insulate itself. It's not necessarily what we consider fat as humans because our fat is just excess calories being stored in the body as uh, fat in order to be used later when the body needs energy because right now it doesn't need that much. Uh, and so that's kind of what blubber is. Fur you might be a little more familiar with if you have a dog. 
or if you have uh, any type of animal nearby, if you've ever seen a horse or a cat, you'll know what fur is. It's similar to hair and it, it's very good at keeping heat in. And the last one is feathers. And if you've ever seen a bird, you'd know what a feather looks like. Uh, down is very common in, in pillows and in clothing. It's, it's very good at insulating. That's why it's so popular. Penguins, again, have a similar style of feathers. But humans, well, we have hair, uh, but we don't have much else to insulate ourselves. So we make clothing. We make t-shirts and shorts and sweatshirts and hats and all types of different things to cover our body and retain that heat. And one other way that we are also able to retain heat is by building houses, right? Uh, and in the Antarctic, they usually have a research facility that's very good at keeping heat in as well as a heater. But uh, for research purposes and for emergency purposes, the people that work in the research facilities have to be able to build an igloo. Now, if you're not super familiar with what an igloo is, an igloo is sort of this half sphere type home made completely out of ice blocks, ice snow blocks. And that might sound a little weird to you because if you know anything about snow, you know that it's very, very cold. So you might be wondering, well, how is the snow going to keep the igloo warm? Well, that's a good question. And there's a pretty easy, simple answer to that. The ice, after exposed to your body heat, which by the way, all humans and animals naturally by living, as long as you're not cold blooded, emit heat. And this heat emanates out of us. That's why we need clothing to keep that heat that we emanate trapped. Similar thing in the igloo. Uh, we are the furnace when we step into the igloo. There is no actual furnace. And so we're emanating heat and the igloo does its best to keep it trapped. Again, there's no entrance at the top because then all the hot air would instantly leave. Hot air rises, right? And the uh, gaps in the igloo are sort of sealed because the heat uh, inside the igloo sort of makes this, this little tiny layer of kind of liquidy snow and this liquidy snow melts together and because it's very cold outside it freezes and so almost all the gaps in the igloo are closed by this process but researchers don't necessarily live in igloos right they have a facility they have heaters but they should be able to and should know how to make that insulation just in case of emergencies and in fact talking about emergencies recently in texas there was quite a weather storm. It got extremely, extremely cold and a lot of people were not prepared. There were pipes bursting because they never expected to be under such cold temperatures. There was snow, there was chaos. Uh, it was very, very, very cold. But today I'm also gonna teach you how to stay as warm as you possibly can if there ever is another ice storm. Hopefully it's not as cold, but hopefully we'll still get snow, maybe. And so one of the best things that I can tell you to do in case uh, it gets really, really cold is to layer yourself. If you have t-shirts, put on as many t-shirts as you can, put on sweatshirts, blankets, really cover yourself. Think of the more layers you put on, the better insulated you'll be, the better you're trapping heat. Again, if I go back to the example of I'm going to use this piece of paper, if I wrap multiple strands of paper around this uh, coffee is what we imagined it to be, it's going to stay even warmer, right? Because that heat is not going to escape. It's going to be more encased. And so similarly, you have to encase yourself. You also have to look around your house and find uh, exits or ways that heat could escape. Maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, something happened and you punched a wall because you were angry. Well, heat could escape through that. So you have to make sure that you cover it up as well as entrances or exits. You have to make sure that none of that hot air is escaping. You also have to look upwards at the roof because again, hot air rises. So if there's any sort of uh, holes or anything in the roof, try to cover that as best you can because that hot air will escape through there. But hopefully these tips keep you safe and sound in case of dangerous weather. But if you know, you're not under any emergency, but you are still curious on how insulation works and you want to figure out what's the best way to uh, insulate something or what is the best at insulating something? Well, that's a good question because we talked about the more layers you wrap something in, the better, right? So if I have, again, my cup of coffee and I wrap it around several layers of paper, right? It's going to be better than just one layer of paper because it's more contained. But what if instead of uh, paper, I use cardstock or something thicker, something uh, that's different, maybe rubber, maybe uh, wool, 
a different material. How can I test that something is better of an insulator than something else? Well, in this case, we have to stop pretending that this is coffee and think that this is a very cold cup of water or bottle of water, which it is. And so in this case, when I hold this bottle of water, I know that it's cold because I can feel the cold. But what's really happening is the heat in my hand, the heat that my hand emanates is going into the cold uh, bottle of water. And that's because heat likes to go cold places, right? Now, if I grab my piece of paper and I wrap it around the bottle, I don't feel as cold anymore. And that's because the paper is acting as an insulin, preventing the heat in my hand to go into the bottle. And so you can test out different materials by doing this. I can say, oh, well, I still kind of feel cold even though I wrapped it around this piece of paper. And so you grab something of similar thickness and you say, uh, hmm. oh, oh, wow, that's a lot better. I don't feel quite as cold when I grab it around this piece of uh, cardboard or magazine or uh, rubber or clothing or cotton, whatever you're trying to test out. And so that's one way to test if something's a good insulator is to see if you feel the cold and you grab something that's cold, right? And that will allow you to figure out what your best insulator is. Generally, cotton's pretty good on clothing. Rubber is extremely good. And then uh, wood is generally very good for homes uh, and building. And plexiglass is actually really fantastic for building homes and insulating them. Uh, several different places around the world have different ways of insulating their homes. And that just depends on what resources they have available. Uh, but hopefully, uh, I taught you a little bit about insulation. We talked about the Antarctic, the uh, animals you might encounter, how they use their natural traits to sort of insulate themselves, as well as how humans do it through the use of clothing, uh, igloos, facilities, and heaters as well. I also taught you how to differentiate between different types of insulators, which ones are best, which ones are worst. You just wrap it around something cold. If you feel it cold, it's probably not a good insulator. If you feel none of the cold, then it's probably a good insulator, right? Because it's preventing the heat from escaping. Thank you, Santiago, for some great learning tips and a potential experiment. If you are interested in exploring the idea of insulation a bit more with adult supervision, I challenge you to follow through with Santiago's experiment. Get adult permission, a cold water bottle, and some household items like paper, aluminum foil, maybe a towel, maybe even some cooking shortening, or anything else you can think of to try and have adult permission for. You can pause the video here for that or note it down as a rainy day activity. Next, we are going to learn how to paint with ice. Hello and welcome to today's craft portion of the video. My name is Ivy and I'll be working with you today. So our craft portion this time is going to be painting with ice. Now this was heavily inspired by President George H.W. Bush's Antarctic Protection Act of 1990. That act, as covered earlier in the video, grants Antarctica special protection status as a land of science. Isn't that just such a cool phrase? That's the actual wording in the bill. As a land of science for wilderness protection, international cooperation, and scientific research. That means that the whole of Antarctica is protected for science. Now, one thing Antarctica has a lot of is ice. One of the things that researchers and scientists down in Antarctica will study is they'll actually bore into or drill down into the ice and take samples because the ice can hold lots of different gases and particles. And the further you go down into the ice, the further it is like you're going into time because as the ice freezes, it's capturing what was happening in the world, what gases were in the atmosphere during that time period. So ice is actually very exciting and a really cool area of research. So today we're going to have our own little science craft with ice.
The image on the screen is an ice cube tray with ice cubes that were colored with different food colorings and have popsicle sticks sticking out of them so they can be painted with. And that specifically is what we're doing today. So let's go ahead and talk about our materials. The materials I used were food coloring, popsicle sticks, water, and an ice cube tray. Now I happen to have a basic food coloring pack of red, green, yellow, and blue, but you may have a different one that may be powder or you might have gel ones. Honestly, any food coloring that you have is fine. Please make sure to have adult permission and supervision when doing any craft activity. All right, so first let's talk about pigments. So science and art are very related to each other. You often have to use some science, some chemistry to make the art materials. So in this case, we are making our paints today. So pigment is the actual coloring substance of a paint. All right, so it's what makes a red red, a yellow yellow, and a blue blue. That's the pigment. And in this case, we're making more of a watercolor because we're adding a food coloring. We're going to be treating it as the pigment, our actual coloring substance and we're adding this to water. So water is what is known as a universal solvent. So water is able to dissolve other substances. And water is really special in that it can dissolve a lot of substances. And that's why we use it as part of washing our hands. Solvents are able to dissolve other substances. So we mix a pigment with a solvent and the pigment dissolves into the water and it thins out and the water acts as a carrier. So what happens is the water is not the color, but it is the vehicle holding the pigment, carrying it from your ice cube, in this case, to your piece of paper. The other thing you should know is the concept of dilution. So to dilute is to make something weaker. On the left-hand side of our screen, there is a red food coloring bottle. It is highly concentrated. That means it has a lot of pigment, a lot of color to it, pigment being the color. So we're going to take our solvent, our water, and we're going to mix our pigment or food coloring together with our water solvent, and we're diluting it. So we're just going to use one, two, three drops of pigment, our food coloring, and we're diluting it with water. For example, here is dilution playing out. On the screen, you see two visual equations of yellow food coloring plus water equals the paint result. In the equation on top, we have yellow food coloring plus one water bottle. The result is a dark yellow that looks almost orange. There is a large amount of food coloring in the water. The food coloring is barely diluted with water. In the bottom equation, the result is a light yellow, represented by the visual equation of yellow food coloring plus two water bottles. More water was added compared to the food coloring, thinning out the pigment. The bottom light yellow version is more diluted than the top dark yellow version. That means the color is weaker and less intense. As we go through on adding food coloring to the water, you can control your final results by how much or how little you dilute the food coloring in the water. Next, let us talk a little bit about color theory. Please go ahead and have your supplies in front of you as well as we will start preparing our paints. So primary colors are the sources of all other colors and they cannot be mixed from other colors. For example, yellow, red, and blue are all primary colors and I have images of the food colorings I used on screen. So we cannot create any of these colors but we can use them to create our secondary colors, such as orange, purple, and green. But let's go ahead and put a pin in that and go ahead and make our primary colors. So first thing first, please have your ice tray in front of you, as well as a food coloring. In my case, I chose yellow to start with. You are going to choose one section of the tray. You need to add in some water, filling it about halfway, maybe three-fourths of the way. Just avoid getting it close to the top. Once you have your water in there, you can go ahead and add one to five drops of food coloring. 
Remember, the amount of food coloring you add affects how much it's diluted and will affect the strength. Okay, so one to five, you experiment with the exact amount you would like. You're going to do this for yellow, for blue, and red. Okay, you can pause the video here if you'd like to with the instructions nice and big and then press play when you're ready to continue. Excellent. Okay, so next, let's talk about those secondary colors I mentioned. So this will give us a nice broad range of ice paints to use. Here are the formulas. For orange, you're going to take your yellow and your red food coloring. You're going to fill up one section of your ice tray halfway with water, and then you're going to take a couple of drops of your yellow and your red, and that will give you orange. On the right-hand side of the screen, I took picture examples of the frozen results of my ice paints so you can see what they're going to end up looking like. For green, you're going to take your primary colors of yellow and blue, just a couple of drops, you know, one to five, and you're going to put them in a different section and add your water, and that's going to give you green. So we're following the same instructions from earlier. This time we're just adding pigment drops from two different food colorings. Lastly, to make purple, you're going to grab your blue and your red, and that will result in purple. Now, sometimes in the results, it won't be readily apparent. It might be like, hmm, that purple, at least for me, I found my purple to look very dark, almost black. But when I started painting with it and it thinned out and I could see just a thin layer of the color, then I was like, ah, there's the purple. So have faith, it will work out. And if you're missing a color, that's fine too. You'll just be working in what is known as a limited palette. And that is very much an artistic thing to do. Okay, next. Here is the big kicker. So we cannot mix black, but we can mix brown. Brown is all of the colors mixed together. So in this case, we can take our three primary colors of red, blue, and yellow and add a drop of each into a section of the ice cube tray with the water and we're going to end up with a brown. It looks somewhat like the purple initially, like you might want to label things. Don't be surprised if you're like, oh, which one was this? But the result will be different and it will really become apparent as you start painting with it because then it starts diluting out onto your page and you're like, whoa, it is a different color. So on this screen, I have the final results of all the things I mixed before I put in the popsicle sticks. On the top, I have, starting from the left, I have a diluted yellow. So that's the yellow where I added a lot of water and one drop of yellow. Next to it is the concentrated yellow. So this is less diluted. So I have more pigment compared to water. To the right of that, I have just my basic red. To the right of that, I have another yellow. As you can tell, like I'm encouraging you to do, I experimented with my dilutions until I got the colors I liked. To the right of that, I have blue. To the right of that, I have the green. Now, this green was the one that came in my four pack of food coloring. I wanted to experiment. How does this green, the one that came with the food coloring, compare to the green I'm going to end up making by combining my primary colors of yellow and blue. Very good. On the bottom row, starting from the left, I have orange, the green I mixed, purple, and then the brown, which was all the colors mixed together. So then I took this tray and I carefully placed my popsicle sticks and I put them in at an angle so they were resting on the edge of the ice tray. Then, in your case, you should definitely ask an adult to help you with this part. Your ice tray is going to go into the freezer. And honestly, I just left mine in there overnight to freeze. On screen now is a picture of my final frozen results. Each section is now a frozen ice cube with a popsicle stick sticking out. And to use it, you just carefully pop the ice cube out and start painting on some paper. So for this part, I drew myself an animal from the Antarctic. One of those ones protected by the Antarctic Protection Act of, of 1990. In this case, it is the king penguin. I sketched it out in pencil and then I got to paint it.
Now in your case, you can paint whatever you would like, just have fun with it. So on the right side of your screen, you're gonna see where I took my purple and I grabbed it by that popsicle stick handle and I started painting and I was like, okay, this is a little bit streaky. So then I discovered, ah, depending on how I hold the ice cube to the paper, if I'm holding it on the edge, if I'm holding it on the bottom, wherever I'm playing with it, that affects how the pigment is applied to the paper. So sometimes it will be rough and sometimes it will be smooth. So now on this screen, my first example is on the left side and my second example is on the right side. So in this case, I grabbed the blue and I started experimenting with the angle of the ice cube. And you can see on the waves, there's some nice smooth where I started drawing with an edge. And you can still see some roughness where I was adding texture to the ocean. So I went for the bottom of the ice cube. I also layered. I put blue on top of the purple that I already had down to give me a different color effect. So there is a lot that you can do when you're painting with the ice. All sorts of different textures and coloring and layering and just all sorts of fun experiments to be had as you're painting. So I'm going to go ahead and show you my final result. This is my king penguin. They have a brown and orange head. They have a belly which is a little bit red on the top and it fades to orange, fades to yellow, and is white down to the bottom where his feet are in the water. And for his back feathers, I have purple, I have blue, and I have just a touch of brown. Now for the ocean, I kept my nice blue texture, that kind of rough texture to kind of show choppy seas. And then I added some nice smooth green on top where I wanted waves represented, just so I had some visual difference going on there. And that's how I made my king penguin. So I hope you have a lot of fun experimenting with your ice paints. It is a super fun activity, and I'm really glad I could share it with you today. On behalf of the Education Department at the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum, we thank all of you for joining us today. For questions and comments, we can be reached by email at bush.education at nara.gov. Again, that is bush.education at n-a-r-a dot gov. For more information and programs, please visit our website at www.bush41.org slash education slash overview. Our three other environmental awareness series videos may be found there as well. We hope you all enjoyed this video and have a lovely day.